All right, this is a uh, CSF culture from a two-week-old baby suffering from meningitis. So when CSF uh, comes down to the laboratory, it's always treated as stat, and it gets special attention because it's not easy to collect uh, spinal fluid. Um, so uh, on the with this particular culture type, type a direct smear or direct gram stain is made and usually it's made with a cytocentrifuge and what that means is that you put a little bit of the CSF into this special chamber and then it spins and makes a circle on a slide and then we're able to read that slide and it's a concentrated specimen. It'll, it makes it a little bit easier for us to pick up to see what we're looking for and mainly what we're looking for is the presence of uh, white blood cells or PMNs, polymorphonucleated cells neutrophils specifically we're looking for those on there and then we're also of course looking for any kind of organisms and you know most times uh, spinal fluid or uh, meningitis is caused by bacteria especially in uh, patients who are of this age group all right so the, the um, let's see here the uh, cytos gram stain showed uh, a significant amount of white blood cells of PMNs, and it also showed gram-negative rods. Now, spinal fluid, uh, we statistically we can say um, certain age groups are more prone to getting certain types of organisms, and uh, babies or newborns. Just due to the birthing process, it's really a tough go on them because they, when they're coming out, they get just uh, shoved in their face and up their nose and in their mouth whatever is in the birth canal from the mother. So organisms that are of particular interest to us are Neisseria gonorrhea, Streptococcus agalactiae, otherwise known as Group B Streptococcus, um, members of uh, Enterobacteriaceae, so those are those very healthy gram-negative rods that are oxidase-negative, and Listeria monocytogenes. So, you know, we hear about women who are, you know, women generally are, uh, are advised not to eat any unpasteurized dairy products because they could possibly pick up Listeria. So, um... Let's go ahead and take a look here what we have on our plate. So as I said on the gram stain, we had big gram negative rods. Okay, now this particular specimen type, we wouldn't expect normal flora. Now sometimes, you know, with blood cultures as, as well, in order to collect the specimen, you have to go through the skin with a needle. So it is possible to pick up contamination, but we really wouldn't. It's a sterile body size, a sterile body fluid. We wouldn't expect any kind of... Uh, normal flora of any kind. So this looks like one colony type, just kind of these grayish uh, colonies. Let's go ahead and take a look at the chocolate. All right, I'm seeing, you know, same thing, this uh, just one colony type. And let's go ahead and take a look at our McConkies. And once again, I'm seeing just one colony type. All right, now from all the pathogens that I listed, so guys, what pattern on the plates fits? I mean, which pathogen is, is sticking out here? Is it Neisseria gonorrhea? Okay, probably not. Neisseria gonorrhea is a gram-negative diplococci, and that would not grow on McConkie's, so I think we can rule that one out. Is it Listeria monocytogenes? That's a gram-positive rod. That's not going to grow on the McConkies. We can rule that one out. Uh, let's see. Is it group B, Streptococcus? That's a gram-positive organism. That is not going to grow on this plate. So we've ruled out really all the pathogens except members of Enterobacteriaceae. So these are these very healthy gram-positive, or sorry, very healthy, non-fastidious gram-negative rods. And when I say non-fastidious, I mean, you know, when we think of the other gram-negative rods, common ones like Haemophilus species, those are fastidious. Those, have, those are kind of wimpy. They have a hard time growing, and they would never grow on a McConkie's plate like this. So I'm pretty confident that we're dealing with a member of Enterobacteriaceae. Now, whenever we 
record or sorry, read a McConkie's play, we always have to comment on whether the organism can utilize lactose or not. And the, how we do that is the colonies will either be pink or they will be clear. And if they're pink, we say that they're lactose positive or lactose fermenters. And if they're clear, meaning kind of like the same color as the media itself, we say they're lactose negative or lactose non-fermenters. Now, these are definitely pink. So uh, what we're looking at here is we have a moderate amount of a lactose positive gram negative rod. Okay, so what are we going to do with this? So the first test we always do when we are working up a gram negative rod that grows on McConkie's is the oxidase test. And of course, we don't do the oxidase test off this plate because the oxidase test is a color based test and the color of these colonies would, may interfere with that reading that test result. So we're going to go ahead and do it off our sheep blood or our chocolate. As I said before, I'm pretty confident that the colonies on here and here and here are all the same organism. Now, I'm just betting that that's going to be a lactose, I mean, an oxidase negative uh, organism. Uh, it's looking very much like E. coli. And uh, so <coughs> I've done the oxidase. It's oxidase negative. Now I need to send out a report to the doctor. Uh, before I go ahead and work this up. Now, the doctor with the direct smear, the direct gram stain, already is aware that there is a gram-negative rod there. Um, so I'm just going to confirm that information, and we're going to go ahead and make just uh, assume here, or based on my experience, you as a student, your instructor may require other things of you, other steps to take. He may even, he or she may even require you to do a gram stain on this, although I don't think that that's necessary. Um, but in my professional opinion, I'm going to say that that's probably E. coli. So my report, my preliminary report to the physician is going to be moderate, probable E. coli identification and susceptibility testing to follow.